A reading from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've been having lots of conversations with folks about the pandemic and about how it's impacting mental health. One of the conversations that made the most sense to me was the fact that we are all operating as a society with our stress responses triggered. That is, the response that our bodies and mind instinctively put out when danger is filtered through. Most of the time in our privileged lives, we go through life with a relatively low stress response, meaning maybe we're on a walk and we see a big dog coming towards us. Our brain immediately scans and assesses the situation. If the dog is on a leash and being walked by its owner, our brains say, everything's fine, keep walking. If the dog is not on a leash and looks like it's ready to take a bite out of you, our brains make a split second decision of flight, fight, or freeze. Our brains usually make these decisions based on past information gathered in our lives or lessons that we've learned. If you froze in the situation with the big dog before and you got bit or scared, your brain would tell you the second time around to flee. I don't know about you all, but right now my stress response feels like it's imploding. I have different sensations on different days. Some of those uh, thoughts and sensations are making me feel antsy. Like I need to be moving or somehow doing something at all hours of the day. Some of my feelings are telling me that I need to just hide under the covers. But the overwhelming feeling that I'm having most days is a stuck feeling. Not certain what the best way to go about things are, piecing together the days as best I can, and feeling that I am either underreacting or overreacting to everything. This is telling me that the stress response that my body has enacted is freeze. And I think a lot of our stress responses are telling us that, unless we are nurses or hospital workers, because our brains have no way of evaluating this situation. This has not happened in our lifetimes, so we personally have no blueprint of how we are supposed to be doing this. 
In other words, the entire human race is making this up as we go along. We are creating new blueprints for the next time something like this happens. The joke around a lot of my seminary friends is that a global pandemic is not something that we were prepared for in school. Jean March did not teach me how to lead worship from home in front of a video camera. Everything about this feels new and awkward and challenging. And I have to think that this might be a little bit of what the disciples were feeling during the trial and execution of Christ. And while I recognize that Jesus did tell them multiple times that this was coming, I'm not sure that there was any way for the disciples to prepare. Jesus had come into their lives and radically turned everything upside down. He took them away from their families and their careers. He instead taught them that the way of the law is not always right or just. He taught them that radical hospitality and care for the most vulnerable is our calling. And he taught them what it truly meant to be a child of the light. But he didn't teach them how to actually do or be the church especially not as society and people advanced through time and got further away from those who remember walking with Jesus. I have to think that as news of Jesus' resurrection spread to all the disciples, that they must have looked at each other and had a really similar stress response. The freeze. The feelings of, what now? How do we move forward? We have never been in this place before. Jesus taught us lessons and gave us some idea of how to move forward, but I forgot to take notes. And I'm scared of the opposition of the people who just killed him. And this all sounds really hard without Jesus being the one leading us. I have to think that they, in a similar way to us, would have said, I just wasn't prepared for this. I just wasn't prepared for this to happen so quickly. I'm making this up as I go along, and I am trying my best to do this well. Obviously, we've had to figure out some very creative ways to do church through this pandemic. But personally, I have also had to figure out how to do community through all of this, too. The people that I used to see every week are now only available on a screen. The plans I had made have all been postponed, some of them indefinitely. So it means that I have had to get creative. One of the things that is giving me life is that my husband decided to invite our next door neighbors to a fence party. In the evenings after our kids go to sleep, we pull up ladders and sit overlooking our six foot fence chatting with our neighbors. Last week at our virtual happy hour, others mentioned that they were also doing crazy things to create community, like everyone sitting out at their, on their porches at a certain time and calling down the street neighbor to neighbor. Or some communities are having folks sit outside for sing-alongs. Folks are writing messages to each other in sidewalk chalk. We are making this up as we go along and we are trying our best. We've had to drastically redefine community and how we can seek it out. And I think coming out of this pandemic, we will have to do that all over again. The disciples were not able to go back to their lives pre-Jesus. I mean, they tried to just go back to fishing, but they were now tasked to make disciples, to spread Jesus's radically challenging message. I think that applies to us today too. We have seen what all we have taken granted for so long, and so we will need to redefine community, redefine how we do church and fellowship. We've been given an opportunity here, and if we just go back to exactly how things were, it will be as if nothing has happened. It will be as if we have not learned anything and that nothing has come out of this. I don't know that I have an answer or a solution for it, 
but I hope that some of you all do. I hope that we can figure out together how to be a stronger, better, more connected church through this experience. I hope that we will all feel recommitted to one another and to the work that we are all called to do. This year's resurrection will be very different. In Easter's past, there's a way in which the church aspect can take a backseat to the planning of dinner, the Easter egg hunts, or the gathering of guests and family members. Instead, let's focus this year on what the disciples were thinking and feeling. Let's focus on the passion of Christ and why this act is so important to our faith. Let's look at what we are called to be as the church and think about how we could do that during this time, but also especially on the glorious day when we get to all gather together again. Let us celebrate this Holy Week. Let's be somber and reflective. Let us feel whatever we are feeling and be okay with it. And most of all, let us emerge as something new, something different, something stronger. Amen.